Shalom, friends. This is Jeremy Gimpel, broadcasting from the mountains of Judea. I have something to share with you that you could never know about, but it's something that's truly remarkable that's happening. Two months ago, Corona hit Israel and flipped the world upside down. And I'm here in the mountains. My phone reception and internet reception are so shaky that I can't even have WhatsApp video calls. And I'm witnessing with my own eyes a global awakening. There's no other way to describe it. And I want to talk about what's happening right now, rooted here in Judea, that is somehow affecting people all over the world. But first, I really need to just share with you my personal journey and my own family's journey. Because in somehow in Israel, we live on this like dual parallel reality where on one hand, we're married, we have children, we have a teenager, we have a baby still in diapers, we're paying our bills and sending our kids to school and helping them with homework. And it's very small and intimate and personal. And at the same time, we are enclave number eight in the Trump peace plan in the middle of this ingathering of the exiles that's happening from around the world in a global pandemic that's shaking the world to reorder itself. And all of us are a part of this restoration and process that's much larger than our individual lives. But somehow our individual lives are a part of a larger process. And all of this is happening to somehow bring us to where we need to be personally in alignment with what's happening globally. And so here's what's happened. Two months ago, uh, corona hit Israel, and we were hit very hard. You know, about a year and a half ago, Tehila and I sold our home, sold most of our possessions, took everything that we had, and put it here at the Arugot Farm and Educational Center. And it was um, quite a journey. If you want to hear about it, go to SoundCloud or iTunes or one of the podcast players and type in Judean Experiment, uh, and you can hear the whole story. But... Um, it was a make it or break it moment, and we felt that we wanted to live a faith journey in our life, and we were being called to make quite an irrational decision. Um, you know, just selling my one asset, moving out to one of the most contested places in the world as far as real estate goes, this deep into Judea as the newest and deepest settlement. We knew we were going to be up against huge challenges, and we decided to live with all of our hearts and all of our souls in all of our mites. And we just took everything that we had and we put it out here. And you know, when we did that, you know, there was no safety net. There was no safety net in our security. There's no official um, army post out here. There was no security net anymore financially. You know, you always think like, oh, well, God forbid, if something happens, I can always sell my home and I'll have money to provide. Um, well, I took all of that and I put it here and I can't sell my home here because it doesn't exactly belong to me. It's sort of a part of a larger um, organization ministry here. The, it's just undefined right now. It's not something that I can sell it. This isn't zoned for residential living. This is zoned for an educational tourist reality. And so I have a staff house here that's somehow a part of this reality, but it's not something that I can just you know buy and sell. I couldn't get a mortgage on our home. So now there's no security net financially. On our family level, you know, we just, what's this going to do to my marriage? What's it going to do to my children? We just didn't know, but we felt like this was best for our family, best for us, what we needed to do in our mission in the world. And we decided to put it all out there. And of course we went through really challenging times, but all in all, we are very literally living our dream. We're building our dream inside the dream in which we are living, and it's just a marvelous reality. And people from all over the world were coming to the Arugot Farm to learn here, to pray here, to study Tanakh here, to have tours here, to experience this prophetic spirit that's in the mountains of Judea, in the place where King David wrote most of the book of Psalms. It's just such a holy place. And we were living the dream. We were the custodians. We were the stewards. We were the hosts allowing Jews, non-Jews, religious people, secular people, I mean, just from Israel, outside of Israel, we were giving them an experience, an encounter like no other place in Israel. Literally everyone that came here was touched. 
And it touches them in different places, whether it be the pioneering Zionistic element of it, the historical element of it, the archaeological, the biblical, the spiritual. I mean, people just walked out of the bus and people just started crying just being out here. You know, it was just such an amazing experience. And all of a sudden, Corona came and shut everything down. I mean, no, no tourism, no travel, lockdown. We're alone on a mountain with no security now. We have no money now. We have no nothing now. We are alone on a mountain <laughs> in the middle of a global pandemic. Oh my God. And so first it was like, oh my goodness, financially, you know, these groups that were coming here, we never charged, but almost every group gave to help water the trees, build the house of prayer, help us keep this place alive. All of a sudden, a massive part of our cash flow stopped. Going on lecture tours, going out to raise money to continue to build this place, stopped. Everything stopped. And I immediately I'm like, oh my goodness. I don't have a security net. You know, when I first came out here, I made a, a, like a, a carved wood sign for my wife. That's a verse out of the beginning of the book of Jeremiah that says, I remember you, the love of a bridemaids who walked after me into the desert in an unsown land. And that was, of course, Hashem remembering the Jewish people that just walked out after him into the desert in Egypt, not knowing where the food would come from, not knowing where the water would come from, trusting that God would provide. And that's just how I felt that Tehila, the fact that she would come out with me to this mountaintop, I just, she's just the love of a bridemaid. I never wanted to forget that. And I never wanted her to forget that I would never forget that. So even this beautiful wooden plaque, but man, we are out in the desert and now we don't know where the water's going to come from. And so that was terrifying. Um, tourism was at, an, at, at a zero. What about our mission in the world? We're meant to be spreading the light. Now what am I doing? Security was quite frustrating. Of course, I went immediately through the process of getting an M16 ammunition, a vest that now I'm not just walking around with a handgun, that I would have at least the ability to, if there ever is riots, unrest, storms onto yeah, communities, I always have to play out the worst case scenario. Um, everyone on this mountain right now, there are four families, all of us served in the IDF, all of us are combat soldiers. And so I immediately wanted to be able to, if it came down to it, which who knows, it still might. I wanted to make sure that I had enough firepower here to defend our mountain. And so all of a sudden I'm just living in a totally different reality. And of course the Corona itself was very scary. I mean, what if one of my kids gets it and then I get it and then who will take care of my kids on a mountaintop? <laughs> what if, I mean, what all of what I will leave Tahila here alone, taking care of 20 chickens, a horse, a couple of goats and six kids alone on a mountain. Oh my gosh, we cannot afford to get sick. So, I mean, immediately after poor, I just pulled my kids out of school and I'm like, all right, we're homeschooling. That's it done. <laughs> so I took my kids out of school before they closed the schools down, but then almost immediately afterwards, they closed the schools down. I just beat them by a few days, really maybe a week. And, um, the future, Man, looking into the future, it was scary. I didn't know where to go. In the past, boy, a lot of regrets, a lot of regrets there. And so now I'm just kind of like forcing myself to really cope with this reality of the corona because I'm sure the corona scared everyone and everyone went through very challenging times. But somehow here it just seems to be a little bit more heightened. <laughs> here it seems to be just a little bit more extreme, which is what I signed on for. And so, you know, as I'm playing out the worst case scenarios, um, I'm really calling out to God. And I'm like, what is the meaning of all of this? I just for weeks, I was walking around in total confusion, disoriented, just walking literally just in the fog, just not knowing where to go, what to do, why to do. And, you know, I had to really focus on the question, why is this happening to me now? Now, that's a really crazy question to ask. Why is this happening to me? Yes, Jeremy Gimpel. There's a global pandemic for Jeremy Gimpel for his own personal journey. Yes, that's true. And that's true for every single person in the world. That the sages of Israel say that a man should walk with two notes in his pockets at all times, figuratively, of course. One says, the entire world was created for me. Everything that happens in the world is a direct communication for you individually. When it's raining in Israel and the whole country is affected by the rain, it's affecting you. What's happening there? Even though it is happening to everyone, it's happening to you. This entire world somehow in divine orchestration is perfectly tailored in the most marvelous fashion just for your own personal 
growth, development as a human being, as a person in the world. It's just for you. And at the same time, in the second pocket, you walk around with a note that says, Va'anochi afar va'efer. And I am nothing but just dust and ashes. Really, really internalizing that we are a speck on top of a speck in this massive universe and galaxies upon galaxies, speck hurtling through this almost infinite universe where there is infinity beyond the universe, and we are literally absolutely nothing. <laughs> And we have to walk around with, again, this dual reality that it's all just for me and my own personal life and at the same time recognizing that we are absolutely nothing. And so as I'm holding on to this, I'm saying, okay, what do I do now? Why is this happening to me? What am I supposed to do? Clearly, um, I need to pivot. Clearly, I'm not going to be hosting groups here now. I have a mission in this world. What am I going to do? We have a farm to build. We have a center to build. And I have people that I'm meant to be teaching. I have people that I'm meant to be reaching out to. I really want to bring a restoration and a light into this world. How am I going to do it now? Okay. So for weeks, I've been praying. And you know, I've given up the title rabbi. I don't really introduce myself as Rabbi Jeremy Gimpel anymore, although I finished the tests and I've received the ordination. I mean, the tests were in Jewish law, and if people ever ask me about Jewish law, I never answer. I go to people that know the law better than me. And I used to have the title because you need a title for people to listen to you. And at this point, I just, if people want to listen, they can listen. It's not the title. This is just Jeremy. But I do feel like I have a very special relationship with prayer. I mean, I came out to this mountain in the beginning um, out of a real desire to pray. And that really is my entire connection to God is through prayer. And I've just spent weeks in this confusion and fog praying. And God blessed me to be in the mountains where the prayers, the first Jewish prayers were written by King David that we all read out today. And you think about that, man, if you're a Catholic in Brazil or a Protestant in Germany or a Jew in Jerusalem or Brooklyn or a Jew in India, someone is sick. When we open up the book of Psalms and we pray to God, he literally taught he taught the whole world how to pray King David. And here I am in his mountains, in his caves, just seeking out God, literally alone. You know, it's not hard to be alone when you live here. I just walk 10 minutes outside of my house and I'm in the middle of nowhere. And so here I am just outside praying. I got my guitar. I'm singing, which is you know, kind of a level of prayer that's already beyond words, seeking, listening, learning a lot of Tanakh, a lot of Tanakh, because sometimes if I can't listen, which of course I couldn't because I just didn't have the peace of mind to really tune in. <laughs> like the antenna was shaking too much for me to actually get any clear reception there. So the Tanakh is a very stable word. And I know that many Jews around the world, they don't study Tanakh as much as they should. And they're very much engulfed in you know, the Talmud, which of course has uh, rabbis' opinions, and of course Abaye and Rava and Rabbi Akiva, what they say is critical and a part of the unbroken tradition of the Jewish understanding of the Tanakh. But um, none of them ever said, thus says the Lord. That's powerful. There were people that spoke literally on behalf of God to the Jewish people. No one in the Talmud ever, ever, ever said, thus says the Lord. If the Lord wanted to say something, he would come out in a botkol, in a voice that people would be able to tune into and speak. But in the times of the prophets, he literally spoke through them to us. And I just felt in this time of confusion, where you don't even know what the news is, what the news isn't, Republicans are saying it like this, Democrats are saying it like this, the World Health Organization is saying this, and China is saying this, what is true, what is false, what is narrative, what is real? The only thing that I know that's real is the Word of God. I want to hear what God has to say, and I'm learning a lot of Tanakh, and then, of course, that is his word to us. So if I'm looking for answers, i got to find it in his word, because his words are right there, and it's a word for every generation until the coming of Mashiach. And so in my anxiety and fear and confusion and just total disorientation, I'm trying to figure it out, and all of a sudden, boom, I'd be given a flash, like a moment of enlightenment, an idea, like a, like a medicine pill in the form of a perspective. And it would light up my way for the next day or two. And almost immediately, the same day or the next day, I went out and broadcast and shared it, whatever I understood, to try to help others through this painful, growing process. 
but it was almost it was it wasn't almost it wasn't like I was like oh I'm such a nice guy I'm gonna go and share this perspective with others people's it was almost something that I couldn't not broadcast I was so compelled to immediately share the perspective that I had it was like Tahila saw oh Jeremy's on his way to broadcast immediately she like cleared the way six kids the animals the chaos let Jeremy go and do his thing and it was just like something that I just it was like compelled to broadcast is not a strong enough word it was just like that's what's just going to happen now I have this light I'm just going to be able to share with others and the feedback that I was getting from my broadcast was so encouraging because I said man at least in all this pain I'm able to bring some light here that's just really beautiful and I feel like the more able we're able to turn the pain into light then the more the darkness retreats and so at the same time I felt like I, I wanted to offer my album my music album in my book which I was charging $25 for to help cover the cost of the production and the editing and the music and the videos and all of that went into that um, I just started offering it for free I was like the only thing that's getting me through this right now is prayer and just let people need to figure it out so here here's music here's the, the guide on how to pray um, according to the tradition of the prophets of Israel hopefully this will help you I mean the Jewish people are so resilient so powerful I mean we've been through much harder times than the coronavirus and we have a technologies we have ways of praying that connect us to the source that allow us to persevere I wanted to give that gift to the world and although of course I want to cover my costs this just isn't the time to cover costs this is just like emergency SOS time just help the believers around the world who want to connect and I started giving out my album uh, for free and then people from all over were just like just downloading my album calling in writing in and it was just um, a really special time and so I'm alone in the mountains and I'm reading the Tanakh and of course I'm focusing on prophecies that are you know like end of days prophecies messianic prophecies understanding like is this a transitional time I mean you how, you can't help but feel like oh my god okay the majority of the Jews or at least almost the majority of the Jews are already back in the land of Israel the Hebrew language has been resurrected from the dead the military here is the most powerful and respected military in the region our economy is strong even this coronavirus right now somehow Hashem has guided us in a way that our economy has been hit hard definitely industries like tourism have been just devastated but for the most part Israel is like slowly but surely getting back on its feet and so I'm looking at this is this a part of uh, this messianic transformation I really want to dig into understanding how are we supposed to navigate this transitional time and you just can't escape these messianic prophecies about what's happening in these times and the Jewish people are in Israel and the ones that are in Israel have a very specific goal and mission it is to open up the gates to the righteous among the nations share the Torah from Zion and the Word of God from Jerusalem to believers around the world that's it look at I'll just look at all of them this is just, that is what is <laughs> that is the vision that there will be Jews in Israel that are confident enough to open up their hearts open up their doors open up their uh, their Torah and share it with the world and believers around the world are gonna just grab on and say yes finally Oh, we got it this is our source this is where we want to go this is where we want to be we want to align ourselves with Israel we want to be one in heart one in spirit so much like Ruth I mean that is the the archetype like your God is my God your people is my people your land is my land your God is my God this is it teach us the ways so we can walk in the light together and I'm just looking at that over and over again and of course all of my broadcasts they're just I don't I don't know who's listening <laughs> I'm just broadcasting right now so I'm always going to speak in a language that's relevant to my brothers and sisters that are Jews but I just know that the nations are listening so it's like I, I've had to develop a very universal language for the Torah that I'm teaching and I said man this is like this is what's supposed to happen now so maybe this is what needs to be done in a daydream you know came to me that I had maybe a year earlier when his pastor from Texas came out here and we were talking and talking and at the end you know it was just like a beautiful vision um, really of a tree a tree that is like rooted in Israel and then branches are going out all around the world and so I really want to understand that and I really want to focus on that what is this tree and what are these branches and of course I'm going to turn to the Tanakh to give us some guidance here because there are two prophecies in the book of Zechariah that give us the keys but they're seemingly contradictory or maybe instead of contradictory they're actually a process 
they fill in the gaps for each other to make us understand what this transition actually looks like. Okay, so in Zechariah chapter 8, um, there's the Messianic vision. End of days is happening now, and you know things are really being transformed. And this is like an ar archetype of this relationship that's meant to be. So thus said Hashem, Master of Legions, in those days it will happen that ten men of all the different languages of the nations will take hold of the corner of a garment of a Jewish man, of a Judean man, an ish Yudi, a man from Judea, saying, let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. And that is just so beautiful, you know, like a Judean man. You know, when Fox News came to do its story about Judea, um, Ari and I, we've just become the spokesmen of Judea. In fact, well, the broadcasters of the Land of Israel Network, Ishai Fleischer, the spokesman of Hebron, the capital of Judea, Joshua, uh, Josh Haston, uh, just all, Eve Harrow, we're all like, here in Judea. And that's marvelous that some of the Land of Israel Network, boom, is like the heart of it is in Judea. And okay, so here we are. And this is like a very beautiful relationship. Okay, the Jewish people, we, we were like the keepers of the Torah, the blessing that was given to Judah at the very beginning by Jacob was that he would be the leader. He would, the law would go forth from him and never leave that source of Judea. And, but here it's very clear. It's like, okay, there's nations that are sort of standing shoulder to shoulder with the Jewish people and saying, not even shoulder to shoulder. They're letting like, like a V formation, you know, it's like a V formation. Like when the birds migrate, they pass through the Aru goat farms and you see them flying in a V formation. All right. The Jewish people, we are the keepers of the Torah, you know, shoulder to shoulder. And the Jewish people are leading the way. And we're like, all right, nations, the believers, the believers within the nations are like coming together. All right. Beautiful. That's really, really nice. And I, you know, I, I would say this a lot to a lot of you know, Christian listeners, I was like, man, the Catholic Church and the Christian Crusades and the Inquisitions and all the chaos that we've been through, the Christians then just did everything that they could to take the Torah away from us, convert us, bring us to church on Sunday, make us bow down to idols, convert or die. And the Jews chose to die. The Jews chose to run, to just, we held on to this Bible, to the Torah, to the flame, the hopes of returning to Israel with all of our hearts and all of our souls and all of our mights. And we held on to it ultimately for you, that one day we knew that there would be the righteous among the nations that would want to learn about Shabbat and learn about Sukkot and learn about how to live in a relationship with the oneness of the universe, who is an expression of the oneness of God. We knew that one day that would happen and that a new brotherhood would be established. So we held on to the Torah through all of our exile. And it wasn't just for us, but in our deepest consciousness, it was for the world, for you. And now there's this vision that the Jews and the righteous among the nations are sort of like locking arms and moving forward together. Okay, that's one vision. Now, there's another vision in the book of Zechariah, again, an end of days vision, but it's something totally different in its essence. Listen to what it says here. Sing and be glad, O daughter of Zion, for behold, I am coming and I will dwell in your midst, the word of Hashem. Many nations will join themselves to Hashem on that day, and they will become a people unto me, and I will dwell in your midst. Then you will know that Hashem, Master of Legions, has sent me to you. Hashem will take Judea as his heritage, his portion upon the Holy Land, and he will choose Jerusalem again. So again, now we have Judea and Judah here, and we have these nations that are coming, but look at what it says here. It doesn't say that the nations are locking arms with the Jewish people and the nations and the Jews as two separate entities are marching forward in cooperation and understanding. This isn't about understanding and cooperation. This is now a unified movement, a unified movement of believers that Hashem is going to dwell in our midst. Look at what it says. Many nations will join themselves to Hashem on that day, and they will become a people unto me. It's a unified movement. It's one tree. The Jews are the roots. And you don't really see the roots. They're not very big. They're underground. It's like a small people. And they're rooted in Judea. They're rooted in this land. But if we are to light up the entire world, how are we going to get to Norway? How are we going to get to Denmark? How are we going to get to China? How are we going to get to Australia? How are we going to get to Texas and Alaska? If the Jews are commanded to be in Judea and to be in the land of Israel, what needs to happen? An actual unified movement 
a unified movement of one tree, roots here in the land of Israel, and then branches, one tree that's just all over the world, bringing light, fruits of light and blessing and shade and comfort and love to the rest of the world in this dark, scary time. And so that's just unbelievable. And so how the heck is that going to happen? So I'm, I, you know, I look at what I know and in the world that I've been engaged with, and there's no question about that I've seen a, a, like a global awakening among the nations. I've been on this mountain and I don't have internet reception. I don't know like, okay, well, how is this going to happen? I, I can't really even communicate properly like a normal human being in a high-tech company. I'm on a mountain with very bad reception. How is there going to be this global awakening and what is my place in this and how am I going to allow this to happen or facilitate it or somehow be a part of it or set an example for it? I'm just going to just step out in faith and try. You know, I just, I looked at my grandfather and, you know, there's beautiful prophecies in the Bible, a promise really that says that as long as the Jewish people are outside of the land of Israel, the land will lay desolate. And as soon as the Jewish people come back, get out of the way, the land will bear fruit. It will become beautiful. The swamps will become drained. The desolation will become fertile and it will just become a beautiful country again. And my grandfather, you know, he walked from Russia to Israel in 1916 when he was only 15 years old. And for two years, he planted eucalyptus trees all around the Sea of Galilee as he joined Kibbutz Deganya, the first kibbutz in Israel. And, you know, it's just unbelievable. But, you know, around the, the, the Sea of Galilee, which is, of course, now the most beautiful place in Israel, the, the Sea of Galilee is like filled to the rim, just, un, just so gorgeous. It was swamps and desolation. People were dying of malaria. It was just horrible. And Jews went out there and just started planting eucalyptus trees to dry up the swamps. And then look at that. A hundred years later, you go to the canary, these giant hundred-year-old eucalyptus trees. And my family takes great pride in knowing that my grandfather and my children's great-grandfather, he, he, he had a hand in fulfilling that vision of the prophets and fulfilling that prophecy. It wasn't just like some magical reality that happened when Mashiach came. It was like a process that we now can take pride in, that we can own, that we can really be partners with God in. Oh, what a gift. And the Hebrew language, that was really my father's generation. And, you know, I look at my father and I was like, well, how did that happen? So my father said, well, you know, your grandfather spoke Russian, uh, my grandmother spoke a few languages. Hebrew wasn't one of them. It was like Polish and Russian and German. What's, how did you all of a sudden just do Hebrew? Hebrew was a dead language for 2,000 years. No one spoke Hebrew. I mean, people read Hebrew. People read the Bible. People read the Torah, read, but read in our Siddur, the prayer book. But Hebrew was a dead language, kind of like the Latin is for Catholics. You know, maybe, maybe some of the scholars and rabbis or whatever read to know it, but it wasn't like no one knew it. No one spoke it. And so my father said that, you know, my grandfather, he had to speak to my father in a language that he didn't know, in a language that didn't really exist, and trust that somehow and in some way, everyone in the country would do the same irrational thing. And somehow without Facebook or WhatsApp or internet or even really good phone lines, everyone in the country from Morocco to Bialystok, everyone did the same irrational thing. Everyone spoke to their children in a language they didn't know and in a language that didn't exist, and the children eventually grew up speaking Hebrew. And the Hebrew language was resurrected from the dead. Just like the book of Sephania says, that the Hebrew language will ultimately be taught around the world so we could all come together in a clear Hebrew and pray together. But that didn't happen by like a magical download that just happened in a messianic revelation. That took people that were like courageous enough to actually try. To do something so, imagine speaking to your children. I mean, like, I have enough problems raising my children, just raising my children. I'm going to now punish my children and try to teach my children in a language that I don't know and in a language that doesn't exist. It's like heroic, on the, uh, epic proportions. But lo and behold, it was like doing something in such a way manifested a prophetic vision in the destiny of Israel unfolded by courageous people taking part and actually just walking in the light that was given to us. And so... I said, okay, 
here I am in Judea. All these prophecies are talking about Judea. I can't help myself but being the deepest settlement in Judea, the newest settlement in Judea, like this, you see the Trump map. I'm like this one like location just out in the middle of nowhere in the mountains of our promised land in the mountains of King David. Okay, fine. This is like what I'm being guided towards. I'm just going to try and see what happens. I'm going to open up the gates and whoever wants to join can join. Now, immediately I was like, okay, a lot of obstacles here. Obstacle number one, my ego. What happens if I get two people from Northern California? <laughs> and now I'm stuck with the two people and I'm like, oh, wow, that was quite embarrassing. Uh, I really put myself out there and I just, no one really joined. They're just not interested because like what, a, a, a non-Jew or a Jew from Israel? I mean, there's so many options to go and learn. Well, well I'm going to be a part of this weird thing that, what is this thing? It's not, it's undefined. It's not a religion. What is this? I don't know what this is. There's two people in Northern California <laughs> and it's just me and them now. Okay. I, that's going to be a, a hit to my ego. That's going to be scary. That's going to be like a lot of time and money, man. I'm going to have to invest in this. I'm going to have to invest in this reality. Boy, it's like the fear of failure. Okay. And how will I even navigate this? I mean, I really like, I don't, no one's ever done this that I know of that I can say, Hey, could you teach me how to figure out how to make a restoration of the divine order where the Jewish people are actually being a light unto the nations and inviting people in unconditional love uh, from different backgrounds and theologies and understandings so we can sort of just walk in this path together. There's no one to, to really consult with. And so, okay, you know, um, in the Corona, we just had a lot of time to work around the house and I'm cleaning up and I'm just doing my thing, thinking about this idea. How am I going to do it? What am I going to do it? What's the platform going to be? How do I reach out? What's going to happen? And uh, years ago, a Christian friend of mine from Texas gave me a framed um, scripture from the first chapter of the book of Jeremiah. And of course, my name, you know, it's just like it's kind of haunted me my whole life in America. When I was a little kid, people used to sing to me, Jeremiah was a bullfrog. <laughs> and it was like a unique name. Who's named Jeremiah? Also in Hebrew, Yermiah. It's just a very different name. I don't know any Yermiahs that I know of personally. So that's always been sort of like a, um, a source of my identity. And, you know, this friend of mine gave me this beautiful uh, frame where it quotes the first chapter of the book of Jeremiah. Now, the reason why I, I didn't have this frame next to me is because, you know, it's like a very big uh, introduction to Jeremiah. And I just didn't feel comfortable putting that in like my house that people, my friends or guests would walk in and see this phrase, like, who does this guy think he is? That he's framing this vision of, his, of himself with his own name, but it was a gift that was given to me, so I wasn't going to throw it away. But it was like put away in a, in a place that just like as a, as a, you know, a nice gift is done. And I'm kind of struggling through this process of figuring out what I'm supposed to do. And the book of Jeremiah, at the, um, in the first chapter, Jeremiah is called, um, I've established you as a prophet unto the nations, an avila goim, a teacher to the nations. And in the same chapter, he says, behold, I will put my words in your mouth. And to me, that was just a spice cart. <laughs> Now, you know what a spice card is. That's probably one of the, mo the most um, amazing Torahs that Arya Bramowitz has ever taught me. Literally life-changing. Uh, Yosef is being sent, sold into Egypt. And the Torah goes out of its way to tell us that he was sold down in a spice cart. And the Torah doesn't waste words. And every part of it is like another nuanced lesson to be learned. And so Rashi brings down the Midrash saying that usually that trail was... Um, carts of sulfur and sulfur smells terrible. They would kind of go back and forth selling sulfur. And all of a sudden there was a spice cart. And when Joseph was put in the back of the spice cart, he recognized that that was so out of order that that was a little signature of God, a spice cart that in this dark time, he's being betrayed by his brothers, neglected by his family, thrown into a pit, sold into slavery. But wait a minute, there's a spice cart here. I can see that somehow God is involved in this. It's like a sign. That like, hey, a communication is being sent down from above for you to notice the out of um, order here. That's like a direct communication, a spice cart. And all of a sudden, I hadn't seen this frame and I don't know how long. And all of a sudden, I come upon it and it's like my, my biggest concerns are just being answered literally right there through my own name and a gift that was given to me literally maybe 15 years ago. <laughs> and so I'm like, all right, let's just, let's go. I'll just, I'll put it out there and I'll introduce this idea and let's see what people think. And this was maybe now a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, something like that. And all of a sudden, people heard the idea and 
I don't know, hearts were opened. And I just, I want to tell you, not that there have been, you know, thousands of members that have joined, but I just want to read off the countries that have joined. Israel, Germany, Holland, Finland, Sweden, Norway, Italy, that just happened two days ago. <laughs> A person from Italy, I've never spoken to anyone from Italy that I remember in my time. Switzerland, France, England, Scotland, all over the United States. Alaska. I mean, I know that's in the United States, but that's like its own thing. Mexico, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, Hong Kong, this is the four corners of the world. And it's amazing because it's not too many. I'm, I'm like getting to know each and every one of these people that's happening now. And it's like, it's, it's a spice card enough for me to realize that something global is happening here. I mean, I imagine that most synagogues have sort of a reach to their local community and most churches have, you know, their congregation probably are in driving distance. And out of nowhere now, from that's the four corners of the world, Alaska, New Zealand, Australia, Hong Kong, Europe, all over America, New Mexico. It's like a global awakening. Just a few people from each one of those countries. Sometimes there's only one from Italy, <laughs> one from uh, Finland. Okay. It's not meant to be the whole nation, but it's like, oh my God. That's happening? I don't even have a good internet connection here. <laughs> wow, something is going on here. And what an example for the world. There's a whole controversy now in Israel that there was some Christian um, uh, television network that somehow kind of tricked the, 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 the ministry of, of communication and signed a contract and their whole agenda was to convert Jews to Christianity and was a whole upheaval. And I'm like, wow, look at this restoration. First of all, the good best defense is a good offense. Why are we just kind of complaining that Christian missionaries are coming to attack the Jews? Why don't the Jews bring the light? Why don't we set an example of how it's meant to be? What a restoration is meant to be? And all of a sudden, I offered people um, levels of participation. It's like $24 a month. You know, that's like $6 a session. And I offered, you know, here, you got direct contact to me. I mean, I'm literally going to be like your mentor, your guide to Hilo for the women. This is going to be our job now. We're just going to try to be that Jew that's allowing people to hold on and to learn together, to pray together, and let it be from whoever wants to come. And some people signed up for $50 a month as sponsors. And all of a sudden, I got a flux of requests from South Africa. And the currency in South Africa now is so weak. Some of the people there couldn't um, afford. I got one request from a nun that says, I just, I don't have any money because I live as a nun in a monastery. And people had signed up for $50, some for $100 as sponsors for people that couldn't pay the full tuition. And I, I mean, I didn't know that any of this was going to happen. I just, my friend said, you should have three levels and let people choose their commitment and their level of their wanting to give. And all of a sudden now, there are people, talk about an expression of unconditional love, that are sponsoring families in South Africa. There's even people that are sponsoring I, I, what I believe to be a, a, someone from a Catholic background. Now imagine that. I mean, talk about theological differences and how beautiful that is, because let me tell you, the theological differences of this group, because Jews are also in the fellowship. Jews are signing up. What can I do? They like the Torah that I'm teaching, which is so beautiful. And they're going to like the other teachers that I bring, whether it be from the network. Arya Bram was, of course, going to have a, 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 a part in all of this. Tehila. And they don't want to miss it, and they want to support, and they realize that they're helping support a much larger process here in building the spiritual infrastructure that will hopefully manifest in the physical infrastructure of this center for all nations, in the mountains of Judea, in the mountains of King David. And so, um, just unconditional love. That really is like the ultimate here. People say like, well, you know what? I love Israel. I love the Jewish people. All of that right there. When you love what God loves, then you become beloved unto him, and then you should love. It's just like it's like a circle of love that just keeps on growing. And so people are saying, yeah, okay, so you have this faith path that you've been brought up in, that you've walked, that this is what you know, this is the truth that God has revealed to you in your time. Most definitely, it's not going to be the truth that's been revealed to me in my lifetime because I've grown up in a certain way. I've encountered certain people. I've encountered certain teachings. I've had specific experiences. I've had revelations. And God is guiding all of us on paths that are totally different because each one of us has our own destiny to fulfill. But in this fulfillment of this prophetic vision of literally being a part of this prophecy no one really knows but it definitely should be with light and love and all of a sudden now people are even sponsoring each other without even knowing those people and it's just like how would they have known and how would i have known i'm just alone on a mountain here and what an example we are setting for the world i mean 
the fact that they're Jewish members is so special for me because I really, when I had this vision, it was like 10 men from the nations. I'm like, okay, I'm just, but it's men from the nations. Who knows? Maybe those men are supposed to be Jews. It meant but one tree. Maybe they're not meant to be a differentiation right now. Just believers. And what do we believe in? We don't know. How are we supposed to understand God? Isaiah 56, God's ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts are not our thoughts. Obviously, he's beyond time. He's beyond space. There's just no way for us to comprehend what is going on, but we're all seekers just trying to walk in the light that he's given us through the prophets of Israel. And so I've gotten, you could imagine a lot of feedback. And of course the Jews, very scared, negative, you know, look at this video, look what's happening here. Of course the God TV thing is being sent to me as if like people are joining this fellowship where there's like a Judean uh, headquarters that's broadcasting. What is there to fear here? I don't even understand that. But then a lot of Jewish people being positive, which is really a new move. It's a new move. You know, until now, most of my work in the non-Jewish world, I kind of like keep it on the DL, on the down low. I don't, I've been attacked so many times that I'm not going to stop my mission, but I'm just going to kind of do what I do and I don't need to make a big brouhaha about it. But uh, coming out publicly like this has been a, a bit of a, a stance, a, a statement. And I knew that I was going to get flack. And of course I got flack. Um, but oh, I got a lot of Jewish positive responses saying, Jeremy, kola good for you. Bring it on. This is the time. Be a light. And that was so encouraging for me. They're like, all right, we're stepping into a new phase now. The coronavirus. I would never, ever, ever have done this had it not been for the coronavirus. I never would have thought in this way. I never would have sought God in this way. And all of a sudden, something is, um, it's just, the coronavirus for us was like a death sentence. <laughs> Everything that I had built in the last I don't know, five years, all that I had given to was at risk. I mean, I had to be changed because what I was focusing on was the wrong focus. I'm focusing on groups here. I'm focusing on, you know, raising funds for this place. I'm focused on maintaining this reality. But most of my time, I'm, you know, just the groups coming here all the time. I mean, my broadcast had dropped off the radar because I was so immersed in everything that was going on here. And, and I, it became my new reality. And so I needed to be changed and change is just uncomfortable. I mean, it's like stretching so much when you're changing it's like almost painful like stretching it's like oh I'm, god is like molding me and changing me as he is doing to everyone that went through this coronavirus because i imagine that all these people that are attending is in some ways without a doubt a direct response to this coronavirus as well people are a little bit more concerned about going in public spaces synagogues are shut down churches are literally banned in some countries still you're it's like you can go to a gun show but uh, pff, synagogue and church no that's not allowed you can go to walmart synagogue sorry that's so people are turning to the virtual and okay you could find a rabbi in brooklyn or you could just get torah from the land of israel and so it's like changing us but i when this was happening i was looking like constantly listening praying and hashem guides us to where we need to go if we're open and receptive karov hashem lechol koreav lechol asher ikreuhu be'emet. that's a psalm we sing it's in it's in my album that God is close to all those who call out to him, to all those who call out to him in truth. If you're like truly seeking God, then he's just right there. He's just going to guide you in a way that you never could have done otherwise, that you wouldn't have done otherwise. And all of these doors were shut only in order to open up the door that I was meant to walk down. And let me tell you, it's crazy, but as soon as I started this process and the ball was rolling and people started registering, and as soon as the first two people registered, I was committed. I said, okay, if two people start and it's two, you know, hippies from Northern California, these are my two people and that's fine. That's maybe that's the way it's meant to grow. I mean, I would be blessed beyond measure if it was just a few hundred, you know, King David started his mission with just a few hundred here in the mountains. Gideon had a few hundred. It would be beautiful to see that. It would be amazing if it wasn't just in America. I mean, I know that so many of my audience, because I'm just, you know, I'm American because I was born there and grew up there as a little boy. So I'm, I just communicate very well. I know about you know, the Atlanta Falcons and I can speak that language. But like uh, the vision that I'm trying to, to model myself after, it's really a global vision. I hope people from around the world join, even if it's not that many. And who could have imagined a fellowship of believers? You know, I wanted to build this place on this very physical mountain. 
And now it seems that a fellowship of believers is building it in spirit first. It had to be built first. And that was understood the Midrash that the temple is to be built and fall out of the sky. What did that mean? I don't think that means that an actual helicopter is going to drop the temple. Maybe that's what it means. But I think that it's like it's built in the sky first. It's built in the world of spirit first. If we're building a center of Torah, for anyone from any background. What is that Torah? What is the message? How do we communicate it? So clearly the message needs to be refined. The following, the fellowship, the friendship, the membership. Who is building this place? What does this place represent as a house of prayer for all nations? What does that actually look like? Okay, clearly we need to build it in spirit before we build it in the physical. And that's just what's happening now. And now a fellowship of believers is building it in spirit first through the idea of a Torah that's relevant for the entire world, and Hebrew prayer. Now, that's Hebrew prayer. I just know that that's a part of it. I mean, this is now already two years ago I started this process of putting out music into the world in Hebrew, because the book of Tzephania gives us this beautiful vision. This is uh, chapter 3, verse 9. For then I will change the nations to speak a pure language, Hebrew so that they will all proclaim the name of Hashem to worship Him together. That is such a beautiful idea, to teach the world to pray in Hebrew, that we can all say the same words, all align ourselves, all align our thoughts, and that's the vision of prayer together. And I started putting out music videos, this is almost two years ago, where I have the translation in English under it and the transliteration in Hebrew above it. And all of my songs are just, you know, a few verses from the book of Psalms. So it's not that much Hebrew to learn. And the first song that I put out was Kol Haneshama. All souls will praise God together. Hallelujah. That's the last Psalm of King David, his last prayer, his last vision, his last hope. And I said, oh my goodness, look at that. It's happening. <laughs> you know, like more than a hundred people have signed up from countries all over the world. And we're like just walking out in faith and I don't know how we're going to do it. And I don't have a curriculum that's built. I'm just trusting that Hashem will put his words into my mouth. My full-time job now will be praying for this fellowship. We'll be seeking out God. What is the message that's relevant for this time? And it will build it in spirit. And so we're going to start after Shavuot. There's 10 days left until Shavuot. And Shavuot, it's King David's birthday. That's so significant. And it's also the holiday that we read about the story of Ruth. It's the holiday of Ruth. And who is Ruth? This, the archetype of the nations. A Moabite who literally, according to the Torah law in its original, or at least in the Pshat, this simple understanding, they can't even marry into Israel. And a Moabite woman joins Israel in this act of unconditional love. And it was that union that's saying that that's, that's going to bring King David. That will give birth to the Messianic dynasty. That's, that's what's happening now. And so people can join until Shavuot. And then right after Shavuot, that Sunday, we're starting. It'll be 6 p.m. Israel time. And uh, it'll be a live session. And people will get you know a Zoom link. And then it'll be at least a, a big chunk. Uh, all of it will be, of course, recorded and then uploaded because people from Alaska and New Zealand and Europe and Mexico, I mean, I, we're just no one, I don't think, will be able to all of us join live at the same time always. So people will have it recorded. They'll be able to review it as many times as they want. And um, it's going to start. And so this is the chance to be of the first few. I imagine at some point I'll, I'm going to have to limit it in some ways because I can't take responsibility for so many people, you know, uh, uh, several hundred perhaps, but I mean, if it gets, I don't know, maybe, maybe this is to, to set an example for other Jews to take responsibility and to reach out. I, I don't really know exactly where this way is going, but I know that we've started something new in the world. We're setting an example for the world. And, you know, I would love for atheists and Buddhists and Muslims to join. Um, but I see that that's, that's not happening right now. Let's just say it's uh, believers in God, believers in the God of Israel. It's just Jews and Christians. And of course, Christian is such a broad term because what does that word even mean? There's so many variations and understandings, some that are like, quote unquote, more kosher than others, some that are still like idols and, and, and crucifixes. You know, it's just like things that are, we just don't even know what to do with as Jews. But let's just put that as a broad stroke there. But all of us are believers in God. All of us are believers in the Bible, the God of Israel, the creator of the universe, the one that, like in Genesis said, Vayahi or let there be light, that, that God, all of us believers in God, morality, truth, goodness, to walk in the light, you know, 
We all know what that means, those that are believers in God. That's why uh, it's like a fellowship of light. It just means to walk in the light, like halakha is Jewish laws. We're just walking in the law, walking in the light, walking how to be in the world. And so the restoration of just fixing that relationship, you know, that would be a giant step towards world peace, towards redemption, towards Mashiach, whatever that means. That would be huge. Tikkun olam, to fix the world, to heal the world. I mean, we're trying. Just like my father did as he was learning Hebrew and my grandfather did as he was planting trees, this is our chance to fulfill biblical prophecy, to make our step towards this destiny. Um, and what to expect? <laughs> well, we're going to have prayer from people all over the world together. I just have a feeling that God is watching what's happening here very closely. <laughs> it's uh, We're probably to expect the unexpected. Um to expect unconditional love because people realize that they're coming into a fellowship of people that are just definitionally different from each other. An example to set for our enemies, that if you are not the exact version of what they want, they'll cut your head off like an ISIS. Here, there's just unconditional love of people that are seeking to be good, people that are seeking to walk in the light. To love what God loves makes us beloved, and then we should just love each other like a fellowship. And you know, in, in English, at least in Israel, a fellowship is like a, a group of people that are learning together. I, I joined a fellowship before my rabbinical ordination that was run by Rabbi David Aaron and Rabbi Bidney Friedman. Um, really, I participated vicariously through Ari. And I just loved that, the Chabura, the learning to, I'm a part of a fellowship in Efrat led by Shlomo Katz. And you can do things with a fellowship, with a Chabura that you can't do alone. It's just there needs to be 10 people to pray, you know, in a minion in Jewish prayer. There needs to be some sort of community. And so this just incredible vision that the prophets of Israel had of a global fellowship, a global 10 men from the nations grabbing hold and all of us coming together. I mean, in a time where they didn't have phones, I mean, how did they send out messages with like pigeons with literally like fire and smoke? That's how they would send signals. How just the vision that God gave these people of a global consciousness of people from around the world coming together in a time where war was just the default in ancient the ancient world and so here we are now after this coronavirus has flipped us all upside down it's humbled us enough uh, to try something new something new is being born in the world today and so with only 10 days left this is my invitation now that i see the direction that it's going when i first started i didn't even know what i was inviting people to join now i can already see that this is um, something truly marvelous and wondrous. And so I look forward to learning Torah together, to praying together, and to seeing where God leads us, because I have no doubt that I will be changed through this process. People that joined will be changed through this process. But if we choose uh, and seek out the growth, seek out the change, it doesn't have to be painful and uncomfortable. It can just be in flow and in line with the change that he's trying to bring to humanity. And ultimately, we know that that is complete restoration, complete redemption, world peace, a new era. And so may this be a sign of the times that we're living in. And so shalom from the mountains of Judea. Of course, I'll always be broadcasting on the Land of Israel Network, always to the public to reach the message as far and as wide as possible. But if you want to join this new group, kind of an exclusive fellowship of believers that are trying to do something new um, and really grow together, pray together, learn together, and figure this global thing out and really kind of step out in faith and try in some ways to fulfill our biblical destiny, then of course you're invited. All you need to do is go to www.thelandofisrael.com slash fellowship. There is information there, a way to click there to subscribe. And uh, if you want more information and direct contact, you can just WhatsApp me directly. That's by far the most efficient way to reach me. Um, and that is plus. 972-544-611-843. Uh, people have called me and been like, Jeremy, you're giving out your personal WhatsApp number on air. I mean, that's crazy. And you'd be overwhelmed. And like, well, it was Corona. I mean, I had, I had time. <laughs> no groups are coming here now. And I realized that that really is a beautiful way to communicate, to get to know people really, just like immediate communications. And uh, it's direct access. That's really what I'm offering is uh, for people to join this fellowship, to know that they have like a real representation here in Israel. And I'm just going to end with this one last story because it's a story that's given me a lot of koach, a lot of strength. I have a dear friend, and this happened before the fellowship. 
and uh, like a real soul sister friend. And I've known her for many years and she's come out to the farm and she's helped in so many different levels. And her daughter um, ended up in the hospital, pregnant, terrible situation. I mean, terrible, terrible, scary as can be. And uh, she WhatsApp me and said, Jeremy, could you please pray? I want to give you updates. I want to let you know what's happening. Uh, can you please pray for my daughter? It's really bad. It's really scary. We just don't know what's going to be. And she's got you know, orphan children, God forbid, and uh, pregnant and her husband. And oh my God. And um, just, of course, it just it's so, it's so obvious. I mean, this is a dear friend of mine, who of course is now a part of the fellowship. And I said, of course, I'm going to take that on. I'm going to pray for her every single day. And I want to get updates so I know like what's happening and what's on, what's the newest thing. And um, I think it's bar none. It's like a miraculous recovery. And I don't know. I mean, I'm sure she had hundreds of people that were praying for her. Um, but there was something very encouraging about that, that there maybe there are some sort of spiritual mechanics here. Uh, maybe there's some sort of like technology, some sort of alignment of having like a, a, a Jew here that was praying for her in another country in Europe. And, uh, and to see that that was blessed, it's like a little spice card for me to say, that's cool. That's good. Let people have that. And let it be like something that's personal. It's not just like, hey, there's some sort of organization over there that's praying for you over there. No, I want to I wanna know exactly what's happening. And I think that's why this fellowship has to be limited in some ways if I'm really to do it right. Um, so I can really know and grow and learn and be connected to. And so this is the opportunity to start. And of course, I, I imagine people will be able to join after Shavuot. Uh, but this is a unique time to really be of the first people that are joining and really kick it off at the very beginning and sort of start and be a part of this global awakening. And so thank you all uh, for everything, just for the listeners around the world that always give me feedback for those that have joined the fellowship. Um, we're entering into a very special time now. And it's been so hot in Israel. And I just so hot here. I'm like right at the edge of the desert. It's so hot. And then I had this beautiful thought that like, you know, all the kids went back to school today. And supposedly the coronavirus can't handle uh, the sun and heat. And it's like all of God's children went back to school and he brought out the heat. <laughs> just, just like to, to quiet down whatever viruses that they could touch on different things outside. And so his protection is always upon us. His eyes are upon this land from the beginning of the year until the year's end. And to have uh, the ability to sort of be here in this land, in this time, and help people that can't come here now because international travel is banned to be like a virtual connection, a spiritual connection. Um, we are blessed to be here in these mountains of Judea. It was a scary move out here, but I just know that it was probably the best move of my life. And hopefully good moves are ahead. We just got to keep on listening and walking in the light. So thank you all. You can reach out to me anytime. And um, I'm really looking forward to King David's birthday. Shavuot. 